said before. Um, yes, we were in a, in a community where, if I told you, if I told you the things that my people believed in, it's a miracle that I'm even a Christian. Miracle, it's one of the greatest miracles that I'm a Christian, right? Let alone an Adventist. But I thank God because like, like, like the, the, the scripture says, my people are destroyed for, for lack of knowledge. My father took it upon himself to enlighten his people with the truth. To the fact that every opportunity that he was given, he utilized it, even if it meant that he was, it was in a, on a bus or in a taxi or anywhere, he would preach the word of God. When he died, like I said before, hello, so good to see you. Like I said before, like I said before, when he died, it was one of the most attended funerals that I've ever seen in my entire life. Right? Very. We had government officials, we had, uh, we had important people come to his funeral. Why? Because this one man was on a mission to educate his people about the truth of the Bible. And like I said, the most shocking thing was learning later that he had only a third grade education. Oh, that, 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 that makes me want to dance right now. <laughs> Third grade education, and yet this man impacted a, I mean, his country with the gospel of, of, of God. But here's one thing that my father did, which again ties so well with, with what we're talking about, about our marriages. When he found the truth, he did not force my mother and anybody of us to follow the truth that he had found. Imagine that. He didn't. Here's what he did. He became a completely changed man. And we could see that there's something going on with this guy. You know, he was completely changed. And I remember, I was young back then, but I don't even remember how we actually ended up going to church. And I, I had to ask my mother later. I said, no, I, I, don't, I don't have a recollection of how we ended up from, because I in the community, the entire community, I don't know if you know, uh, it's one thing that I, I would maybe challenge you to, to research on your own time. You see, when you talk of missionaries, when they came to, to Africa, right, we have different missionaries from different denominations come, right? And one of those is Catholic. When a Catholic came into a community, right, they don't challenge your beliefs or anything. They will just say, keep doing what you've been doing. But add more to your beliefs, Catholicism. So, because of that, they became so popular because they, was, they were not challenging any, any beliefs. They would just say, no, just keep believing what you've been believing, right? So what I saw in my community was that uh, people would go to mass on Sunday, right? And then after mass, the adults would go to bars and, 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 and all the community areas, and they would actually would be there with their priest and drinking until, until late at night. While I was young, I, I, I was questioning this. And there's no difference, right? But because that was the only thing that was available, after, uh, I, I would be going there every Sunday and sitting there and listening and, 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 and drinking the, the wine. And, you know, it's every Sunday, by the way. Drinking the wine and the, and the bread every Sunday, right? Nothing wrong with that. You know, and then after that we would go uh, to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the places where young people meet and we have fun. And then we come back home, we sleep, and every Sunday this happens. But I don't remember how we transitioned from it because what I remember is that now going adding another day where we go to church. 
and it, on a Saturday, and which was very odd because we were the only people who were doing it, and everybody else was worship was still going to church on on Sunday, right? And then because of our beliefs, right? Not not Christian beliefs. We we had our own African beliefs, Zimbabwean beliefs, where um, Thursday, Thursday is our Sabbath, right? You see, the thing is, what the devil does is that he doesn't take away the Sabbath. No, he doesn't. He just gives you an, another one, which is not the truth one. <laughs> Sad. But so here was I as a young person, very happy and excited. You know why? Imagine three days of no work in a week. <laughs> right. Because on Sunday, we would go to church. We are Catholics. Right. On Thursday, we are not going to church because of my traditional African beliefs, right? And then on Saturday, when I'm going to church, three days in a week, boy, I was the happiest kid ever, right? But, and people would challenge my, my parents and say, especially the first time they started doing this, right? Imagine, you lose, if you're a farmer, and you lose three days, you're supposed to suffer the consequences Here's what God did. The production on the farm actually increased as they had less stakes. And in 1982, I remember very well, 1982, my father had died. Had died. My mother stayed on the farm doing the things that she loved and, and with us. Please listen to this one. We had the worst drought in 1982. The worst drought. Still, even it's, 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 I think it's the worst ever. Say, and here's what happened on this year: we had completely transitioned. Now we are no longer Catholics. We are no longer uh, uh, worshiping or practicing our own traditional beliefs. We were now full-fledged Seventh-day Adventists, right? And God wanted to show something, but I didn't know I was just young. And my mother said to the, to the government officials and anybody who was in the area, says, no, I just wanted you to know that I am now a full-fledged Seventh-day Adventist. So what it means is that I will no longer participate in anything that you guys are doing. Uh, I, 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 I believe differently now. Boy, was this woman persecuted. Mm -hmm. She was so persecuted, yet she remained calm and peaceful. She did not retaliate. She would pray for them, and they would persecute her. And in my little mind, I'm like, Mother, just, just, this is not worth fighting for. Just, 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 just believe like what everybody else is believing. Why is this, why is this so important? But she says, later you will understand, my son, that we are not going to do that. And she says, we would rather obey and even die obeying God than follow what I know is not truth from the Bible. And here is what happened in 1982. Worst drought happens. And the, the local officials who are part of all the religion that I say, they are saying, no, everybody is forced to contribute to, to some rituals that needed to happen in order for rain to come. <laughs> because they needed to appease their God. And they said, everybody is going to do it. If you don't do it, the consequences are going to be harsh. And they meant it. But my, my mother said humbly and, and said, no, I'm not going to do it. I respect what you do, but I believe that it's God who gives us rain. Fast forward, the day of the rituals, the, the ritual is done, and then rain doesn't come. They are dancing, they are doing all the things, they are doing all what needs to be done for the rain to come, and rain doesn't come. The next weekend, my mother says, uh, I am inviting everybody to my homestead. And uh, 
we are going to pray to God for rain. Because I believe that God will give us rain. A few people trickled in, and the majority of them just for the sake of curiosity, not because they believed her. They came, she prayed simple prayers. God, we know that you are the creator of the heavens and earth. You are the ones who gives us rain. Your people are suffering. We need rain. Your animals are suffering. They need rain. Birds are suffering. They need rain. Simple prayer. Guess what happened that day? <laughs> it rained. But here is what God did. In order for people not to think that, hey, you know what? Probably it was the it was what it was what they did last week that caused the rain today. Here's what God did to ensure that nobody will ever doubt who did it and for what reason. Rain came, but guess where the rain fell? Mom's property only. <laughs> I have seen so many miracles in my life, but that one was the coolest. <laughs> when uh, you could actually stretch your arm like this, right? And your arm would get rained from here and no rain here. So we were the only homestead <laughs> that harvested that year, 1982. And cars and, and, and government officials came from all over the country to come and see this miracle. If anybody, you see, where I am today, because of what God has done for me and what I've seen with my eyes, there is nothing that you can tell me about God that I, if, if, I don't care what you do, what the miracles you do, for me to believe that God is not there. Nothing. Because I've seen things with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. So when I teach on principle, I really mean it, ladies and gentlemen. I really mean it. I had a mother who lived on principles, who taught on principles, who would not bend south or east, who was so focused, if it's a principle, it's a principle. I don't care what you do and what you don't do. I don't care how you threaten me or she will do according to the principles of God. Mm -hmm. That's why you see me uh, uh, do what I do. I believe that the moment you adopt a principle of God and you apply it to your life, the results, the outcome are predictable. You can, you can predict what, what will happen because God is not a liar. And for every principle, there's a promise. Did you know that? <laughs> this is so beautiful. I wish we had more time to argue. Dig it. For every principle of God, there's a promise. Just like the principle of tithing. God says, <laughs> bring it into my house, right? The offerings and the tithes, faithful and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and bless you so much that you will, you will find no room to put. Right? That's a principle that I saw with my own, my own eyes. When my mother would send me to school with no tuition. <laughs> and the little money she had, she would actually take it and, and what? And, and tithe. And, and I'm like, Mom, you are actually taken away from my tuition. She says, no, we're not taken away from your tuition. This is God's money. And she would, she would give happily and joyfully. In my little mind, subtraction. When you are subtracting and you don't have enough, that's creation of problems. Right? That was in my mind. But here is what I, 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 I experienced over and over again. I go to school, half of my tuition, I call off my tuition, and my mom would say, God will provide. Right? And I go, guess what? God provided every single year until I was done with school. 
-hmm. He provided. Sometimes I would, I would say, you know, the best, the, we call them best, is the people who, who, uh, who he would come, come and say, hey, if you have not paid tuition, go home, right? And then I would stand up, right? Because in my mind, my tuition is not paid. Because I know that I did not pay. And he would say, you, you, you sit down. Your, your tuition is paid. Like, How did, who? And then, and then he said, sure, come and sit. Your tuition is paid. Who paid? Imagine, he even doesn't know who paid. All he knows is what? It's paid. Principle living. Principle living. Try it. All the principles that we've talked about in marriage, just go and try them and see what God will do for you. Because for every promise, for every principle, there's a promise. God never commands you to do anything that he doesn't give you the power to enjoy the promises. The promises. Right. So, we started with Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And we said, um, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then let them have dominion over the earth, of, of, over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we say that when God, when God said this, right? When God said this, when God gave the dominion over the entire earth. He gave it to husband and wife. I mean, that blows my mind. That there was a time when in the entire earth there was just God, husband and wife. And he says, let, let us make them and let them have dominion. And that those plural words, let them have dominion, let them have dominion. Them. Husband and wife. Male and female. Let them have dominion. And we say that marriage is a shared dominion. It doesn't matter what we find after Genesis 3. After sin ended. In God's original intent, in God's original plan, marriage was supposed to be a shared dominion between husband and wife. And in this regard, God actually is saying, I am partnering with husband and wife. I am giving husband and wife the word, the stewardship of the entire earth. I mean, let's read it again. Let them have dominion over the earth, right? Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over all the what? The earth. If ever it's a thing and it's on the earth, it was given to husband and wife. So one of our responsibilities that we, we have as husband and wife is actually stewardship of God's creation. Let them have dominion over the entire earth. So what it means is that God actually wants you to have a portion of this of his stewardship today. Because like we say, once you know God's original intent, you now know God's will today. Because God is immutable. He doesn't change. So what it means is that God is looking around for couples that understand their stewardship responsibility. And God wants to put in your hands some, some responsibility, some dominion in partnership with him to manage some things for him, for his glory, for his honor. Yet, in our marriages, 
we are fighting to dominate each other. Instead of embracing God's stewardship. So that together as a team, we manage things for God. That's what the devil does. He is now causing husband and wife to be fighting for the little resources that are in the bank or somewhere. When God is saying, no, 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 you have lost focus. I want you to, to have dominion over some things. I want to put some, some responsibility on you to dominate for me. <clears throat> God is saying, I want you, husband and wife, I want to give you some responsibility so that you can manage some things for the kingdom. Because in his plan, he works with husband and wife. Because we just figured out that after creating the entire earth, he is giving the dominion to husband and wife. And that goal, that, that intent, doesn't disappear because God doesn't change. He doesn't change. Therefore, God is saying, I want you to be conduits of blessings. <laughs> I say this again. Look everywhere. Even, please listen, look everywhere, even among people that don't believe in God. Find for me a husband and a wife that actually work together as a team and see how blessed they are, mm -hmm. even though they don't know God. And there we are, jealousy of them and wondering, even being mad at God, to say, God, how, how dare you, God? We, 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 we return the tithe, we, we worship you, and yet you are blessing the unbeliever. And God is saying, oh, actually the unbeliever is actually following my principles. You see, God will work with an unbeliever who knows the principles of his kingdom than a stingy Christian. What is, what is the stingy Christian benefiting God? Because it's all about God, right? So, I'm saying, I have seen people getting liberated in this way. I'm saying, for the first time ever, as husband and wife, can you just imagine working together as a team, supporting each other, becoming the wind beneath each other's wings, and working together, having common goals and common objectives and, and mutually benefiting, not anybody fighting to win. Show me a couple like that, and I'll show you a blessed couple. That's so why I gave you the story of this young couple. We met last year in October. They were about to divorce. Young couple in their 20s. They were about to divorce because they didn't know this principle of oneness. Right? When God says, and the two shall become one, it means one in everything, including finances. Right? Oneness. Nakedness. In financial terms, nakedness everywhere of your life. I wish we had more time. And this couple is what they did. They said, no, we want to try this. This is in October. We met them. And then in, in, in December last year, they said, we really want to try this. I said, it's a young couple in their 20s. In January, for the first time, they had a family budget. <laughs> for the first time after marrying for, for five years, for the first time, the husband knew what, her, what his wife earned for the first time. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, the wife knew what the husband earned the first time. And for the first time, they put their money together. And for the first time, they had mutual common goals. This is December, when they were preparing for January. So they started January this year together. <laughs> United as a, as a couple. And I told you, the 31st of last month, they moved into their own home. Mm -hmm. Five months later, imagine that. They moved in their own home. Not, on, not, not a mortgaged home. No. Mm -hmm. Totally financed by them, by themselves. Cash. Mm -hmm. They are not paying a penny. 
How is that possible? Principles of God. God means it when he says, I will bless you when you keep my promises and my statutes and my laws. He will bless you. I've had several people that have tried this. I'm not saying if you do it in six months, you have your own home. No, I'm not saying that. Because God doesn't work with us as masses, right? He works with you as an individual. But what, what I can promise you is that if you work together as a team without fighting each other, but with actually common goals and, and pursuing one, and going in one direction, and nobody fighting each other and praying for your spouse and working together, I can tell you that you will see a remarkable improvement in every area of your life, including finances. God is not a liar. I've seen it in my own life. God is not a liar. I don't know if Kimberly remembers where this computer came from. You told me the story. Oh, I told you the story. You told me the story a, week, right. a, couple, a couple days ago. A couple of years ago. I, I, we were doing a, an evangelistic series, right, in Kalamazoo, downtown Kalamazoo. And the first day, it, it was, a, it was a, in, an international thing. Everybody from, you know, the majority of people were, were logging in from various places. And uh, we had, we had uh, a computer problem. And uh, the next day, the next day, because Australia and us, Australians are way ahead of us. I think right, right now there is it's like probably almost, uh, I think the, it's, it's, it's the next day in Australia right now. Exactly, it's like 6 o'clock in the morning. So this lady was awake to watch the series that I was preaching in the, in, in the early hours of the morning. And she saw us struggling with, 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 with COVID. And I said, you know, my computer is old and, and and here's what she did. She purchased this computer brand new. Right? Purchased a brand new computer and an iPad and, and even a watch. <laughs> and she sent she sent next day. And we actually got the uh, the, the the way earlier than you know God worked in this. By the time I was preaching the next sermon, I was I had a new a new thing. I have never struggled financially in, in, in my ministry. I need to be open and honest with you. I have never, when I say never, I really mean never. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. If you are really doing it for God, God will pay for it. And not only this, this laptop, but this, this, this family, after that, all the evangelistic series I've had after that, they just ask, how much do you need? How much do you need? And they will send $18,000, $20,000 know, to fund the entire series. Principles of God. Even the suit that I'm wearing here, I didn't buy this. I mean, if I told you how many, how much clothes that I have that I knew that are still in the, that are still in the, in the, people would just buy and send. I've never struggled since when I was young, and my mother applied those principles. God is saying to you. I want to put some resources in your hands to manage for me. But he's saying, I will not give those to you if you are not united, if you are not one as a couple. You can pray as much as you want. You can even go to the mountain and pray on top of the mountain, right? And you can, you can fast while you are on the mountain. 
not only one, even for 40 days and 40 nights. You can come down from the mountain holy, sanctified, dripping with holiness. Understand? But as long as after you come back, you don't apply the principle, nothing will happen to you. That's why the verse says, what can the righteous do when the foundations are destroyed? <laughs> this is what, what keeps people that are Christians so mad. Like, you know, God, I go to church. God, I call upon your name. I even have t-shirts that have said, God, I'm a child of God. Even my bumper sticker says, I'm a child of God. Why are not blessings come to me? Your proximity to God is not beneficial to you if you don't apply his principles. Your nearness to God means nothing if you don't apply his principles. So what God does not respond to our desperateness. Now oh, let me repeat that. You can be so desperate, right? Like super duper desperate. I don't know what, what that means. You can be as desperate as you want, right? God doesn't rule the world on desperateness. Otherwise, we, we can try to uh, outdo each other in desperateness. <laughs> and die in our desperateness and believe actually that God doesn't exist. You know why? Because God rules the world and manages it through principles. What attracts God in our lives, what, what makes us so attractive to God is obedience. Mm -hmm. Obedience. I, I wish I had learned this sooner and quicker. Obedience, I mean, just obey all the revealed truth to you and see what God does for you. Obedience. Obedience, not prayer. <laughs> Understand? And I want to repeat that. Because there are many Christians who believe that they can pray their, their, their way through anything. No. The Bible itself says obedience is better than sacrifice. Which means that you can kill bulls and cows and, and, and do it. God, that, that does not impress God. What impresses God is obedience. Obedience. If you want to get the attention of God, obey even when things don't make sense. Okay. You know, I learned even from my young son when he was five years old. We go to the, um, to the post office to do a transaction, and then we come back home. When we got home, I looked for my, my wallet. I couldn't find it. So we, we, uh, my, uh, my thought was, I probably left it in the car. So I went to the car. I'm looking. He's just following me. He's watching me. And we look in the car. We look in the car. Couldn't find it. Closed the car. Locked it. Went back in the house. And then I called the post office. I said, did I leave my wallet in there? And the lady said, no, let me check. And she checked. She said, after you left, nobody has come here. This is in, this is in, 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 in Columbus, Michigan. Touch me. She says, after you left, nobody has come in here. So she looks and says, no, there's no wallet here. And there was, because there was some significant amount of money in the wallet. And then I am, I am pacing back and forth, and my five-year-old says to me, Danny, why don't we pray? <laughs> why don't we? You see, I then realized that I did not even have the faith to pray. So I said, why don't you pray? And he prayed a simple prayer. He said, God, please help my daddy find his wallet. Amen. <laughs> oh, man. So after that prayer, um, 
out of just sheer curiosity, I said, no, let's, let's go back to the work. Okay. No, to the, to the post office. Let's trace our way back to the post office. Probably, uh, probably it fell outside the post office or somewhere. Since nobody has been to the post office, if it's outside, we can find it. Then we, we go to the car. I open the car door. Guess where the wallet is? Right there on my seat. Mm -hmm. And I know it wasn't me. You see, there, when, I, when I'm saying this, is that I believe in prayer. Mm. Right? I don't want you to miss that. I believe in prayer. Mm. But prayer is not a substitute for disobedience. Mm. You cannot say, because I don't want to obey God, now I'm going to pray. Prayer is not a substitute for work. You cannot say, you know what, I don't want to work. So therefore, I'm going to pray. After you have worked, and before you work, pray. Because here's what God says, I will bless the work of your hands. Mm -hmm. So if you don't work, what does he bless? Mm -hmm. Nothing. All right. So we said uh, marriage is designed to be a picture of Christ in the church. And we're not going to talk about that because we already talked about it. And it was, then we say that marriage is designed for procreation, which was when? Yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. Marriage is designed for procreation to produce holy children mm -hmm. for the kingdom of God. Man, if ever there is a, a, a tough responsibility, it is this way. Mm -hmm. Because God is banking on you and I to produce holy children for the kingdom of God. Not just citizens of this, of this world. No, they have to be born, just like Jesus. You know what the Bible says? And Jesus grew up in stature. And in what? In favor with man and with God. That is the, that is the, the pattern that we need to follow. That we raise up in our families, children, that will be in favor with the world and with God. Mm -hmm. Good citizens of this kingdom and the, and the kingdom to come. So what it means is that it means we have to be intentional about how we raise our children. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, this one here, this one here is a tough one. Heaven is banging on us. The kingdom of God is banging. Whatever children that we've been given by God, God is banking on you. He has no other plan. He's banking on you and I. This idea that we have later on to say, no, uh, after we have failed to raise our children, right, then we pour money into evangelism. <laughs> it doesn't work as good as it should. What if we invested those dollars into raising a child? And ensuring that they never end up end up in the in the kingdom of the devil. What if we actually committed each other to pray and, and, and train our children? What if we actually sacrifice some things? Sacrifice some things for the benefit of our children. Yeah. Because Children don't just grow up to be. You know very well, if you have raised a child, <laughs> they come out of, of the womb bent towards sin. You get the point? You see an infant, an infant, when, when the infant is angry, refusing to suck the, the breast. Refusing an infant. Who told you that you, know, you can be so manipulative? You, that's manipulation. She's going on a hunger strike. <laughs> Serious, an infant. She said, you know, because you, you irritated me, I'm not going to drink that thing. I'll die today. And then you, you say, oh, baby, you can't do that. You know, and, we, and then the baby is smiling. 
very manipulative. Who taught the baby to be manipulative? I hear people say, oh, this is my angel. No, no, that's not an angel. <laughs> Far from it. And you know it. We have to train our children to be good because they come bending towards sin. If you don't train them, no child will end up right on their own. None. Even psychology teaches them that. We have to, we have to inculcate in them some values. That's why, that's why there are so many, uh, 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 so much research that has been done on this way. That, and, and my brother wanted to share this. I hope you, you brought that today. So, can, yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's research after research that shows that children that grow up in a family where mom and dad are together, they, I mean, it's, it's, it's like day and night. There is no other way to bring out good children than for mom and dad to be together, loving each other, and for them to be a university where children are learning about God and values. Mm -hmm. Do you know that people, schools don't teach character anymore? Mm -hmm. <laughs> People don't teach karate anymore. I was actually, I was invited a couple of weeks ago to, uh, at, a, at a graduation, and I spoke on karate. Do you know, I asked, I asked, I asked, these are thousands of parents, right? I asked, can somebody tell me one pillar of karate? Nobody raised their hand. Sad situation, it's a Christian school. And nobody knows what are the pillars of character. And yet everybody has a child. And I said, no, maybe your parents don't know. Let me ask your kids. Tell me, children. Tell me, if anybody would tell them, well, I give you money right now. I give them an incentive. Said, tell me one pillar of character. Nobody could. Imagine that. We are in a, in a space where character it is nothing anymore. Nothing. Nothing. Now, if a parent doesn't know what character is and what are the pillars of character, how can children end up just having good character when we don't even teach character? Character development. How do you develop character in a child? How can you even have that conversation? If we don't know what character, what, what, what are the pillars of character? I hear people say, I, I, I want to be a virtuous woman. I want to be a virtuous woman, right? Every woman wants to be virtuous, right? But I, and I ask, what is virtue? Because virtuousness comes to them from the word of virtue. What is a virtue? Can you, can you tell me two virtues? <laughs> And people don't even know what a virtue is. Yet they want to be virtuous. It's just lip service. Because nobody teaches virtue anymore. We need to go back to the, to the, to the principles of God. That our children grow up knowing what character is. And then that they know what virtue is. Because for every virtue, that God requires for our sanctification. Those virtues are actually perfected in marriage, if you, I wish you knew that. Every virtue that is required for our character is actually perfected in marriage. So, we are not called to just give birth to kids. That's the easiest part. The biological part is the easiest. <laughs> That's the easiest. But it is the training up when that child comes up. Man, man. From day one, 
what you do or decide not to do, what you say and decide not to say, has significant impact on the child who's growing in your home. Because if daddy is not loving like Christ, this little boy will also not love like Christ. Because daddy in the home is the only Christ you will see. If mommy is not submitting as the church must submit to, to Christ, if she's militant in her insubordination, and, and that little boy, that little girl is hearing mother say, over my dead body. And we have the audacity to expect that child <laughs> to be submissive in marriage. Where will she learn that? When the university has taught her to be militant in her insubordination. She grows up fighting for self. Well, that's what she saw mom doing, fighting for self. He grows up physically handling mother because that's what dad did. Because marriage, one of the purposes of marriage is to be a university where children learn all the virtues. Not by, not, not only by sitting down with parents in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, like the Bible said yesterday, but also by seeing, visually seeing, the example of a loving couple. The best gift you can give your children, for those that have younger children, the best gift you can give your children is the sight, the daily sight, of a loving couple. The daily sight of grace and mercy and forgiveness at play. Because if they never see grace and forgiveness and repentance, where will they see it? Where else will they see it? <coughs> and we expect them later when they are old to now practice what they never saw. How is that? I said, when my father died, I was 10 years old. Yet, those 10 years with my father left me wanting to be a good father. Imagine that. 10 years. I only had 10 years with my father. And that those 10 years shaped my values up to this day. If you ask me today, what is your goal in life? I want to be like my dad. This ministry came out as a result of me frustrated because I had failed to duplicate what my father did. And I wanted to be like my father. I am still on a journey to become like him. Imagine that. <laughs> the impact that a father has on a child is immeasurable. That's why Satan wants to remove fathers in their homes. Mm -hmm. Because he knows that when a father is present, man, when a father is what? He's present. present in the child's life, even the devil does not know what to do. But the moment a, child, a father is not there, oh man, he, he does his own way with the child. Presence of a father, a father who loves like Christ, a father who sacrifices like Christ, a father, a father who fights for for for, uh, for the protection of his of his both physical and spiritual threats. Fighting is what children, both daughters and sons, need to see. Last, last week, Sunday, uh, at my house, when we were celebrating my son's uh, uh, and, um, graduation, one of my friends said, uh, he said, you brought, you brought 
let me not say that because these things are all right. <laughs> but one of my friends said, this doesn't, doesn't really concern me because this is the duty of the mother toward the daughter. This doesn't really concern me. I have left this to the mother. I said, my friend, I'm glad you said that in my presence. This is your responsibility. Every daughter needs to know that daddy will fight for me. He said, but I thought that was my responsibility to my son. And I said, tell me the scripture. And I said, daddy, focus on your sons only, and let this the, the mother do. I said, raising a child is not a mother's responsibility. How do I know that? Because God says to, to, to Adam, I will make you a helper suitable for you. So whose primary responsibility is it? It's the father's. Then the mother helps. But we have actually turned those things around and say, no, raising of children is for mother. And then when daddy has the time, they can, no, that's exactly the opposite. It is my responsibility, my primary responsibility to ensure that I raise my children with the help of my wife, not the other way around. So I challenge fathers, even in non-religious circles, I challenge fathers and say, who told you that it's manly to leave work and go to the bar and then come back home later when the children are asleep. Who told you that that's manly? A real man? A real man who understands his responsibility? From work home straight to be with the children before they sleep. Well, that's my primary responsibility. Even while I am away, I need to find out this what when you see what, when I told you the story of my young boy, it's 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 something that I cry about. Because if I had done that to their to his brothers, they would have avoided some problems. But I, I didn't. You see with this one here, it doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't. And I really mean it doesn't matter. Even if the president was to call me, it doesn't matter. Daily duty is number one. Mm -hmm. So where I'm speaking anywhere, if time comes for my son to sleep, I'll drop everything that I have. And I will, I will sit down on the phone with my, with my son, and we worship together, we read the Bible together, and then he sleeps. And the results are day and night with the, with, with the other two kids. But I didn't do that. The good thing is that God says, in your days of ignorance, I forgive you. But now we have known it's no longer an excuse. We have to go there and be present. Present. I don't, it does not matter what has happened in the past. Fathers need to be present. Mm -hmm. The devil fears a father who knows his responsibility. Mm -hmm. One of the purposes of marriage is to glorify God. To give glory to God. Our marriage is must. Glorify God. Mm -hmm. It's easier said than done. And I had to ask myself, what is to glorify God? And as an entrepreneur and a businessman, I said to myself, okay, so if my marriage was my business, <laughs> who should get it? Who should be getting the proceeds? Right? If if marriage was a garden. Who should be harvesting? 
I mean, if you, if you, sister, if you plant a garden, beautiful flowers and, and beautiful uh, vegetables, and I come there, and you don't know me, I come and harvest, what, would you be happy? I mean, you don't, you don't need to be a psychologist to understand that somebody has been robbed. Right? We have spent the entire week talking that marriage is all about God. Right? Now, if, if God instituted marriage for his benefit, for his benefit, for his kingdom's benefit, to fill the, his earth with holy children, and to, if that was God's desire, then the question is, who should be gaining the glory? But here is what we have done. Is we, we said, hey God, we understand this is your garden. <laughs> but and thank you for planting your garden, by the way. But now we are going to harvest. So we enter marriage now with the question, what am I going to get out of this? Me. Right? Me. What am I going to get out of this? When the attitude should be, what is God, God going to get out of this? Mm -hmm. So because we ended marriage seeking our benefit, right? Seeking our glory. When we are offended, when I am offended, I, I said, who, how dare you offend me? Right? Then, because you have offended me, bye-bye, I'm out of here. Because the reason I came here is for you to do things. For who? For me. So our marriages have become a place where self is worship. The sad reality. One day, uh, I was talking to this, to this young lady. She had a, a, a six-month-old baby. And she's on the phone on the other side. And she's trying to, 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 uh, to get the, the attention of the baby. And, she's, and then she says to me, I'm tired. I said, why, why are you tired? She says, I wish you understand. I am just so tired. I said, what is happening in your life that makes you tired? She says, I can't keep up with his demands. I said, okay, tell me, what are his demands that you can't keep up with? And he said, six months ago, I gave birth to a healthy baby. Right. Before I, 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 I had a baby, I had a very good body. Right? And uh, I... I, 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 I went, made sure I ate right and I kept my weight at a certain level. And he is demanding that I, I spring back to what I used to, to look like before the baby came. And she says, I, I have signed up for the gym and I am going there every day, but my body is not yet strong even for, for those strenuous activities. I am tired. I love my husband. But I'm tired. And I'm, I'm at a point of giving up. Because I don't know how to do this. She, she says, I expected him to understand what I'm going through. I didn't make this baby on my own. He understands that when somebody gets pregnant and it, it changes, the, the body changes. You know, I don't just snap back into what I used to be and I'll never be what I used to be. But yet, he is making demands, not only demands, even threats. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, they are out there, ladies, who are taking good care of themselves. Imagine that frustration. 
love your husband, but he's making unrealistic demands on you. How do you even begin to manage that? Because to this husband, this marriage is all about him. The entire marriage and his wife is all about him. And he cannot even begin to think his wife's body changing. <laughs> and he doesn't even know how to love a wife who has a body that has changed. Because when he looked at his wife before she, she had a baby, that's all that he was attracted to. Mm -hmm. Imagine that marriage then is gone. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Because self is at the center of it. The women, some of the women we meet on the road jogging, they're not doing it for health. They're doing it to keep up with the unnecessary demands of their husbands. They're being threatened. So they have to. I have heard them speak to me, several. They don't have, some of them don't even have children, but you know our bodies change as we grow old. And yet somebody. Who knows that they are making un, unrealistic demands and say, you know, because this marriage is all about me, you have to, or else. And then they are signing up to gyms and running every day and night, and you meet them and you're like, wow, she's really doing for her own health. No, she's trying to keep up with the unrealistic demands of the husband. Or the wife. When God is saying here, marriage is for my glory. Marriage is for my, for my glory. Mm -hmm. Marriage is nothing. Is, is, when we fulfill all of God's primary purposes for marriage, we will get the benefit as a byproduct. And we said marriage is, a, is purpose as a university. A university of unconditional love. Your children and my children need to see because they, they are in this university every single day. Marriage is an institution created by God for the purpose of reflecting the unconditional agape love that, that he has for his people. The question is, have my children seen and experienced real agape love? Unconditional love. <laughs> have you ever noticed that God never gives us a reason for loving us? You hear what I say? Have you ever noticed that in the Bible, God never gives a reason for loving us? You read, I love you with everlasting love. But why? It doesn't. Even people that understand this have composed songs like, I don't know why Jesus loves me. Mm -hmm. I don't know even why he cares. All I know, he loves me. Because he never gives a reason for loving us. Because once you find a reason for loving somebody, that becomes the condition for your love for them. Mm -hmm. If you say, I love you because, whatever you say after because becomes the condition for your love for them. Mm -hmm. Love is love. Regardless of what the person decides to do or not do. That is unconditional love. We don't use it as a carrot. Love is not a carrot. Where you say, hey, if you behave right, I will love you. But that's exactly what we do. 
Let me give you a, 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 a real life example. Let me use my friends here. Henry and Kimberly. Let's say, Kimberly, before Henry leaves work, you text her a clear message. Hi, hi honey. Please buy. And there are numbers. Number one, this. Number two, this. Number three, this. Number four, this. Five items only. Wait. This is, let's say you leave work at 5 o'clock. And you send that message at 3 o'clock. And then, a few minutes before he, he leaves work. Like we always do. You know, we ask him. We forget, right? She sends another reminder. Three minutes before work. Hey, honey, don't forget to buy number one, number two, <laughs> number three, number four, number five. All right. And then Henry responds, thank you, honey, I got it. See you soon. Right? And then 30 minutes later, Henry is in the driveway. Right? And you are excited. My number one, two, three, four, five things are here, finally. My husband is here. And then Henry shows up <laughs> with, <laughs> with his hand in his pocket. And one hand, he has his keys. And in your mind, you are thinking, probably, he forgot them where? He left them in the car. They are Henry, um, where are the things that, that, that are that I sent you. And Henry says, oh man, I'm so sorry, I, I forgot. Right. Don't feel bad, Henry, I do that all the time. Right. <laughs> but imagine, here's the thing. Now imagine you saying to Henry, honey, I love you. That's <laughs> 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 not usually what I say when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, imagine yourself. God bless you, Kim. Because Kim will actually say that. Imagine yourself saying, I love you. Now, let's change this. Did now. she say she says that? That's not what I, if I said it's not usually what I say when I have <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, I didn't say, I thought that's what she says, and then you said she said that, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> now imagine, let's reverse, let's reverse the story. You don't even send the message, right? Out of his own volition, he has actually, before he left work, he actually checked in the, in the, in the pantry and seen that you, you are low on certain things. Mm, I, I love this husband, right? He actually sees them, and then he, <laughs> he brings, out of his own, own, he brings everything that you want. What's the natural thing to say? Honey, I love you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Unbeknown to us, those two scenarios tell us that we use love the wrong way. We are using love as a word. Rewarding. We're using love as a reward for good behavior. Mm -hmm. And when there is no good behavior, what do we do? We withhold our love. Mm -hmm. I mean, go and take inventory on the times that you have stored your spouse, I love you. You are going to notice that every time you say, I love you, he or she did something good to you. Which means that we are using love as a reward for good behavior. Mm -hmm. There is a condition that the spouse has to fulfill in order for the I love you to come out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Imagine if Jesus would do that. Mm -hmm. How many of us here mm -hmm. would be here? Yet the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I said, go and take inventory 
at the times you have told your spouse, I love you, you are going to see that there is a behavior that the, that the spouse practiced, something that they did, something that there is an activity that they did that prompted you to release your love to them. <laughs> because according to our human thinking, love is something that is given when somebody behaves right. We cannot even fathom saying I love you to somebody who behaves well. Yet, agape love, real love, is unconditional. Therefore, we need to teach ourselves to say I love you even when the condition is causing us to have a negative feeling or effect. I love you. And it is that when we actually do that, that trust and intimacy begin to develop. What is intimacy? Did you know that you know, many psychologists have various uh, stages of intimacy? But I've, I've summed up into three stages. Please listen to this. I've simplified it. You can go out there and say uh, intimacy, three stages of intimacy by Isaac. This is mine. You don't worry about anybody else. Because if you go to read someone, you'll find, because I, I, I try to simplify things for people to understand. According to me, there are three stages of intimacy. The first stage is truthfulness. Truthfulness. Where, when asked, the spouse tells the what? The truth. The truth. Even if they don't want to hear it. Even if they don't want to hear it. Exactly. <laughs> when you are asked, you tell the truth. That's the first level of intimacy. Truthfulness. You ask me a question, I'll tell you the truth. Honey, how do you feel right now? I'm angry. Okay. Who are you angry at? You. <laughs> right? Even if you don't want to hear it, that's the truth, right? Because before that, they, there's no intimacy. If you asked, if you asked where there's no intimacy, honey, how do you feel right now? I don't know. I don't know. Who are you? Who are who? Who 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 caused you to be where you are? I don't know. Did I do that? Every answer is a lie. Mm -hmm. It's a total lie because mm -hmm. there is no truthfulness. They are not even intimate yet, emotionally. And the sad reality is that most marriages are not even at the truthful first stage because we don't tell each other the truth of really how we are feeling about the other person or about life in general. So what it means is that if I hurt you, you are going to show me through, through action that, that, that I hurt you, but you are not willing to tell me that I hurt you. You're just going to act. Either I give you a silent treatment. Mm -hmm. Right? Silent treatment, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk to you. I want you to figure out what you did. But the question is that if you don't tell me, I'll never know. Right? Mm -hmm. So now, because I see you, you are acting up, and you're not acting normal. Then I asked you, honey, what happened? Nothing. That nothing is, is loaded because is there something. <laughs> but because there's no intimacy, we keep ourselves at bay. And we wonder why we drift away from each other, right? Because there's no truthfulness. So in the first stage of intimacy, there is truthfulness. You, you tell me, I'll tell you. You ask me, I'll tell you. But those that get better move from, from, from that truthfulness. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? What do you, I want to I want just, just try to find out. If, 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 just tell me, what do you, what do you think? What's, what do you think is the next level? Openness? 
very close. Very close. Transparency. Transparency. Which is actually openness. Thank you, Kimberly. Now, at the transparency level, you are living in glass houses. That's what transparency means, right? There are no curtains. There are just glasses. The spouse can see through. Everybody has, lives like an open book. You don't need to ask any questions because every information is what is readily available. That's the second stage of intimacy. Transparency. Right. You don't have to wait for a question to be asked. The spouse volunteers information because they are living in, in, glass, in glass houses. You don't have to ask questions. Information is, is given sometimes before things happen, before the spouse asks, before you're just, you know, I'm, I know I'm not going to make it in time at home. So I'm calling my wife, hey, honey, I'll be late tonight. She doesn't have to wonder what's going on. I volunteer information to her because I'm transferring. How much I, I earned? Oh, I mean, she knows already because when I, I bring my paycheck, right? She knows my paycheck. And if, I, if money is going into the account, she actually has the password to the account. Actually, in transparency, the, the money goes into an account. Nobody is wondering, where is the money going? What did she do with the money? What? You know, I know, she, I know. No, everything is right there. Right? Third level. Third level. Again, who, who think, who, who, uh, what do you think it is? We said the first level is truthfulness. The second level is transparency. And the third one, the deepest level, is what? It starts with a V. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. You are vulnerable. What does it mean to be vulnerable? Hmm. What does it mean to be vulnerable? Place yourself in, in the hands of someone. Exactly. You place yourself in the hands of somebody else. This is where you begin to share deep and intimate things that are so personal. Things that can be used against you. This is where people that are at this stage, they trust each other in such a way that you wonder, how can they, they, they do this? Why? Because they are at that level where, but you, you realize that you don't just come from nowhere to vulnerability. Right? You, 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 you spend some time on truthfulness until you have trusted the person enough to open up and become transparent. And then you stay in transparency for a long time, right? Until you have trusted them enough to be vulnerable. And when you are vulnerable to each other, this is where you know where, the, where the, all the bodies are buried. <laughs> you get the point? You know where all the bodies are buried. And you fight for, you, you are like a pair of scissors where anybody who tries to get in between you is cut while you're protecting each other. And you know that at this point, whatever I tell my husband or my wife, they will not use it against me. Not in a conversation with anybody, not even in a conversation with me. But they will use what the, the delicate information that I've shared with them, they use that to pray for. This is where I remember going into one couple's house and uh, they are friends of ours and we went there for dinner and they, 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 the husband, the, sorry, the, the wife is a nurse and she came home and she says, honey, honey, 
oh, we have a new doctor at our, at our, at our, at our hospital. We have a new doctor, and he's not my, he's, the new doctor is not my boss. Man, this guy is fine. You get that? You get that there? Exactly, that's what I said. That's exactly what I said. Because my marriage was not yet there where I could even share deep things like that. And she said, this man is fine. He's handsome. No, the truth is, let me ask you the question. Don't we work with handsome and, and pretty people? Why don't we tell our spouses? Because they get jealous. Because we have not come to the vulnerability stage. Because you know that if you share that, it is going to be used against you. But these people know each other. That I can actually tell you that this woman is beautiful. I have no desire for her, but I, I just noticed that she is what? Beautiful. And I can actually share with you that, you know, she is beautiful. Guess the response of the wife is what, I mean, the husband, is what blew me away. Because I was expecting him to, to react like what I would have reacted the back then. He said, honey, he said, you see this goatee? This goatee? <laughs> he surely cannot be this handsome. <laughs> <laughs> they actually laughed about it. You see, when you have come to that level, with delicate information that can send somebody to jail is now acceptable in your conversation and it becomes a, a, a point of laughter and, and that now you have become to the vulnerability stage. Now, I went into, into another couple's home. And the husband says, while we're praying, I said, no, I'm about to leave. Let's pray. What, what can I pray for? And, 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 and the husband says, honey, can I share with him? And she says, of course, share with him. And then here's, here's what the husband says. He says, um, there's a lady at my work that has become to me a temptation. Imagine sharing with your wife that you are tempted. And, and he said, I have asked my wife to pray for me. I don't wanna I don't wanna see. But this woman has become a temptation to me. <laughs> when you have come to that point where you know that if I share delicate information, it's not going to be used against me, but my spouse is actually going to make it a point of prayer. It transforms your marriage. We, we prayed about it together. About a month or so later, uh, he would actually reach out and say to me, thank you for that prayer, because uh, uh, that, this lady has been transferred to Wisconsin. God intervened. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, what if he had not shared? Mm -hmm. Because if he had not shared, you see, when you share your temptations and the spouse and yourself begin to pray about the temptation, God intervenes. But when we don't share, guess what the devil does? Mm -hmm. With secrets. He uses it against us. God designed marriage so that even the deepest of secrets can be shared in the comfort of love. Imagine kids who grew up in, in that area of vulnerability. Imagine what they learn every day. Where they know that between mom and dad, there are no secrets. Imagine what they would do in their own marriages. Do you think kids are dumb? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are not. Hear it from me. 
they are not. Kids will not tell you some of the things they witness with their own eyes. But they know when we are hypocritical. They know. They really know. If you had an opportunity, if you still have young kids, just watch them when they are playing house. I went into a home, visiting, pastoral visit, get into a home. This was a new couple that they'd, uh, they'd been in the church relatively in the, the five, six months or so. I was a new person in that, in that city. And then the moment I entered, they had not been coming to church. The moment I entered, and the mother came out of the room, and uh, this young man says, Mom, Mom, is this Mr. So-and-so? Thank God I was, I was a Mr. So-and-so. Mm -hmm. Understand? Mm -hmm. Before Mom responded to that question, she, 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 she puts more information to the question. Is this Mr. So and so who did so and such and such with uh, Mrs. Such and such? Hmm. Apparently, husband and wife were gossiping about another church member. Hmm. And, and when, when she saw me, she thought I was that, <laughs> that man who mom and dad were talking about. Mom, is this so and so? Mom, is this so and so who did such and such with, with uh, Mrs. So and so? I mean, and she specified directly, exactly. And I knew all the names that were said, I knew them. Do you know that it took that woman an hour to get back to where I was? But she had stepped into another room. What an embarrassment. Now the question is, what are these children learning from their parents? <clears throat> Yet we think, oh, well, they're not listening. No, they are. They are listening with, with such exactness. They are recording in their little minds everything that we are conversing. Yet God wants our marriages to be universities of love. Mercy, forgiveness, where children observe every, every good thing that God wants them to learn from their parents. Education, educating our children is not the responsibility of the teachers. Let me repeat, the education of your children and my children is not the responsibility of teachers. Teachers are helping us. My children's education is my responsibility. But we have, we have surrendered that responsibility to teachers, completely surrendered. God is saying every marriage, every marriage is a university. We talked about a bit of it last I mean, yesterday. But I want to emphasize that because if we fail on that responsibility, we have not only failed our children, we have failed the kingdom of God. Because it is from every family that the kingdom of God is filled. Where does God get these people to fill their kingdom? <laughs> every one of them comes from our families. Mm -hmm. That's a weighty responsibility when you think about it. Mm -hmm. That one would cause you to stay awake, praying and pleading with God for strength and wisdom to know what to do with these precious children. Tomorrow we'll be ending this series. Not because we have finished everything. No. Mm -hmm. We have not even touched 
the surface. But I pray that God will, and through his spirit, allow you the freedom and the wisdom to apply one, two, or three of the things that we have talked about. Mm -hmm. Let me see by raising your hand anybody who believes that they have been blessed this week. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Oh. I challenge you. I challenge you. Because, uh, I mean, I, we, we just met. We're just getting acquainted. Well, but I want to urge you, if you have been coming here every day, I want to urge you, whenever you see a church that values marriages, in this day and age, you have found a home church. Because you go out there, I haven't, I've been in this community for a long time, in, in, in Michigan. I've been to churches, many churches. Very few churches value families and marriages anymore. When you find a church that values marriage, that invests time, that brings a speaker from outside and pays the speaker to come in, you have found your home church. So I'm urging you, stay close. Yeah, I haven't talked with them yet, but I am willing to come back for a revival. Mm -hmm. And I expect to see you to all of you. Mm -hmm. I really do. If you're not here, that's why I want your numbers. If you're not here, I'm going to call you. I said, where are you? Where are you? Come here. I left you in this church. Don't go anywhere. Right. Secondly, secondly, I want to challenge you. Really, really challenge you. Um, God, when God gives you information, remember what I say. There is no purpose that is given for self-preservation. If you believe that this message that you have heard today is just for you and you only, you miss the point. Right. This, you know some couples or a couple you know, probably someone who's going through some things. Please, do them a favor. Share what you've learned with them. Share. Now, I know there are some people saying, well, I've, I've, I, was, I wasn't given the gift of sharing. Here's what I say to you. Remember what I said, do like the Samaritan woman, who just said, come and see. Come and see. Um, my information, I'm going to leave it with uh, Kimberly and, and Henry. If you want it, you know, my wife has given up on me on that one. I collect numbers. <laughs> I really do. Right. I, people call me sometimes in the wee hours of the morning. This is my calling. This is my calling. And I, if you call me, and if I don't answer the phone, leave a message. Yes, it may take me seven days, but I come to you. I promise that. I will call you, and we will have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I have more than two million followers on Facebook, and they all have my email address, and some of them have my number. I really mean it when I say I will make myself available to you, because this is my calling. So, don't be crushed under the weight of marriage problems. We are here to help you. We are here to help you. If you need help, reach out. Reach out. If I'm free, I'll come to your home and sit down with you and, and we'll share. We'll share the word of God. But more importantly, wherever you are, wherever you are, if you see couples that are struggling, here's what I challenge you. Make a group of, of couples, right? Just a group. Have, have them sign up. Don't even call me. Just have them sign up. Once you have five, five, six, seven, eight, ten couples, call me and say, I have a group. Let's, let's find a date. Let's find a time. I will do it. For me, it doesn't matter where two or three couples are coming. Here's <coughs> why. What I told you yesterday. Any fool can count the seeds 
in an airport. But only God can count the number of airports in a one. You see. So that's why I will help one couple and give them the time they deserve because one couple that understands this can change the world. So I remember last week, uh, where, 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 wherever I was, uh, is what happened was that um, one, one gentleman has been following me for so many years. Right. So when he heard that I was going to be speaking, at this church, he came with his wife and, and few friends, and he says to me after the session, "Boy, I was so disappointed." I said, "What? What? what why were you so disappointed?" He said, "Do really people understand that it is a, it is a privilege to listen to this information?" Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm I was so disappointed that the the church was empty. There were about 20 couples in a very big church, so it seemed like the church was really, really empty. And he says, I was disappointed. He says, when I came, I told my wife that Let's, I want, want to be the first people there because I think this place is going to be full. Because this gentleman shares with me some good stuff. And he says, I was really, really disappointed when I came and the, the, the church is empty. We like that kind of disappointment. <laughs> we really do. But for me, it's not about numbers. Numbers are good, but that's not my focus anymore. I will do the same even for a couple, one, even for individual, one person. But sometimes God only needs one person in the marriage. And through their power of influence, Oh man, the ripple effect that come out of that. You, our duty is to sow the seed. Mm -hmm. The harvest belongs to God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for giving us this privilege to meet, of meeting these wonderful people. Tomorrow will be concluding. And I want to submit these precious souls to you. The fact that they braved every, every day to come here, Father, I pray that you may bless them for that. Transform their marriages. Transform them as individuals. Bless them abundantly. Show up in their marriages and, and, and vindicate their faith in you. In the future, should you give us another privilege to meet together, it is my desire to hear powerful testimonies from them, saying from the seed that was sown here, there has been a harvest. We leave everything in your hands because you know what the future holds for everybody who is here. Bless us as we live tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Tomorrow it's going to be at 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Right? So come in around 10, I mean, 10.30 or even 9.30. There will be programs the whole day from 9.30 until 11 o'clock. But I will start speaking around 11 o'clock. We don't have the afternoon or the evening. So we only have one left. Don't miss that. Thank you. Thank you.